Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. More than 13 months after the death of George Floyd, Americans still seem to be living in a state of moral panic about race. Whereas previous generations had seen American history as being an arc that had continually bended towards greater justice and freedom in the last year as both the Black Lives Matter movement had gained support and ideas like critical race theory and intersectionalism have moved from academia and the margins of society to the mainstream and are being adapted in schools, the question of how Americans think about themselves and whether they are sufficiently anti-racist has taken on something of the aspect of a religious cult. The moral panic has fueled an increasingly aggressive council culture and impacted the willingness and ability of many of us to speak freely about the issues further dividing the country along lines of a political culture war that seem increasingly hard to breach. Those who follow these issues have some idea about how they are affecting our politics and even foreign policy, especially as they have impacted opinions about Israel and the Middle East. But today we want to focus to some extent about what this means for children and families. How do we raise children to see past race and treat each other fairly as individuals at a time when it seems as if so many of our institutions, especially schools, can see nothing but race? To discuss this and some other issues and stories, I'm very honored to have as our guest today one of the most interesting and prolific observers of the issues that impact children as well as families. Naomi Schaefer Riley is a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, focusing on issues regarding child welfare, as well as a senior fellow at the Independent Women's Forum. She's a former columnist for the New York Post and a former Wall Street Journal editor and writer. Her seventh book, No Way to Treat a Child, How the Foster Care System, Family Courts, and Racial Activists are Wrecking Young Lives, will be out in October. Naomi, welcome to Top Story. Thanks so much for having me. Great. Thanks Thanks for taking the time to be with us. I want to start by asking you about your upcoming book, which focuses on the way this moral panic, as I discussed, I described it about race, is impacting one aspect of our social service systems with regards to foster care. Why is this issue particularly important now, and what do you think it tells us about what's happening in our society in general? Mm. So I started writing about the issue of child welfare about four years ago. I had previously written some columns about the New York child welfare system when I was a columnist at the New York Post, and I had written a little bit about the issue when I wrote a book on American Indians. Um, That community has some of the worst child welfare outcomes in the country. Um, But about four or five years ago, I really started traveling around the country, looking at different state child welfare systems, trying to understand uh, the whole system from soup to nuts. Um, And one of the things that you now increasingly hear about the child welfare system uh, is, for first of all, there's a movement now uh, to abolish the child welfare system, abolish foster care that has um, a sort of a parallel to the abolish or defund the police movement. Um, and the idea is essentially that, you know, uh, child, the child welfare system is the problem. That is, this, that is what is victimizing kids today. Um, And they point often to the racial disparities in the child welfare system as one of the reasons that the system is uh, systemically racism, suffers from structural racism, um, and one of the reasons that they think it needs to be abolished. And so I like to start by just kind of grounding people in some numbers, which I think is really important to do. The first thing to note is that Black children in this country are about uh, twice as likely to be victims of maltreatment um, as the average child is in this country. Um, But the second thing, and I think this will strike people and really make it clear that this is not just about racism, is that black children in this country are actually twice as likely to die of maltreatment um, as white children are in this country. And so, you know, there are lots of ways that you can kind of fudge, you know, crime statistics and say, oh, well, you know, you're just picking up somebody, you know, um, because they looked at you the wrong way or something like that. But I mean, these are dead black children. And I think that we need to have a response as a country 
um, to that kind of maltreatment. And it may be that the child welfare system is serving the needs of black children and black families at a different rate than other children because they have different needs. Um, so I, I think it's also important to think about what are the things that lead to child maltreatment in this country, again, before you dismiss the whole system as racist. Um, one of the things that we know is highly correlated with child maltreatment in this country is family structure. And we know that family structure is not distributed evenly in this country. Black children are much more likely not only to grow up in homes with single mothers, which are much more likely um, to, um, in, in which children are much more likely to be abused, but also um, in homes where there's a single mother and a non-relative male. Um, that is a huge risk factor for children, as we know. It has been throughout human history, frankly. Um, and so it should not surprise us then that some children have different outcomes than other children. So I would say um, this chorus of abolish the child welfare system is, is growing louder and louder. There was a conference recently at Columbia Law School to discuss this. Not only do they want to abolish the child welfare system, foster care, residential care, um, they want to, um, in family court, for instance, they want to um, change uh, CASAs, who are court-appointed special advocates representing children. They want to change those into family advocates. And I think this is really an, an important point, not because it's going to necessarily have some huge impact on the system, but because it's symbolic. I think that the advocates here see the adults as victims, uh, not the children. And so they want to bring the whole family back together, no matter what. Um, they see the adults as victims of racism, of poverty, of all sorts of other things. And in many cases, they certainly are. The question is, you know, should we still be engaged in protecting the children um, when they cannot be safe with their parents. Um, which leads me to the final way that the, um, the, it, the debate over race in this country is impacting the child welfare system, uh, which is that um, when it comes to placing children in uh, foster care or adoptive situations, um, it's actually illegal in this country to discriminate on the basis of race. If you have a black child in foster care uh, or who is, uh, whose parental rights have been severed so that they could be adopted, um, it is not supposed to be a factor that should be considered whether the potential adoptive or foster family is white or black or Hispanic or Asian. Um, but unfortunately, this law is regularly flouted. Um, it's regularly flouted by family courts, by foster care agencies, by caseworkers. And to the point where, um, you know, and, and now you actually have people who are uh, suggesting that this law be overturned, that we should be discriminating, because they think that the most important thing when placing a vulnerable child who has been abused or neglected in a safe, you know, loving permanent home, they think that all of that should be put aside and we should make sure that their skin colors match. Um, so for me, this has been a, a kind of, um, every day I feel like a new sense of outrage at the way that our, our debate about race is impacting the outcomes for the most vulnerable children in this country. I think most people don't even understand how wide ranging the impact of, you know, the obsession with race can be. Um, what, I mean, I, I guess, the, you know, part of the answer is what institutions do these abolish? You know, people want to abolish the child well, their institution want to recreate. I don't think they want to go back to orphanages, obviously. Yeah. Um, which were abolished, you know, in sort of the post-World War II era. Um, and I, I speak from some experience because I was, you know, my father was raised in, in an orphanage, you know, where he was abandoned by his family. And actually it was a very good experience for him. But, you know, what, what you know, do we care more about race than we, you know, and, and these racial issues than actually what helps kids? Right. It's, it's an important question to ask people as when you ask them, what do you mean by defund the police? What's the alternative? Like, how, how will you keep law and order in a city? What do you mean when you say abolish foster care or abolish the child protective services? Um, and the answer for these people is, is amazingly um, naive and absurd. Um, so the, the answer is essentially we can keep kids with their parents. We just need to provide a lot of services to the parents and the kids. Um, it is we need to, um, uh, you know, provide a lot of kind of community supports, whatever those mean. Um, and I think that they, uh, they, they have all sorts of, there's a, a manifesto that was recently put out by one of these groups. And there was actually um, about a paragraph under the heading, End Poverty. 
So that was sort of, that's one of the solutions here. Just, you know, we just need to end poverty and then we won't have, you know, a, a child abuse neglect problem. It's, it's really, it's quite shocking when you think about what they're, what they're proposing to do with children's lives. Um, and I, I should say, you know, poverty is definitely correlated with abuse and neglect. Um, but it is, we do not, we don't think that poverty is the is necessarily the cause. It could be that um, you know adults who end up in poverty have all sorts of problems that also cause them to abuse or neglect their kids. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that one thing leads to another. In fact, I think what people fail to recognize about child welfare in this country is how much it's driven by substance abuse. Um, especially, you know, the, the kids who are most in danger in this country are kids under the age of three. And, you know, if, if you have children, I, I encourage you to sort of uh, imagine that great period when your kids are mobile but totally irrational. Um, when your kids are, um, you know, you have to run around the house trying to prevent them from, you know, touching a hot stove, running out the door, um, swallowing Legos, you know, all, all sorts of things that, that really present great risks to your children and it feels like you're running around constantly trying to supervise this. Now I, am, I encourage you to imagine trying to do that, you know, while you're high or drunk. It, it's really hard and the children are really at great risk. And so I think, you know, when we talk about the drug crisis in this country, people are, are very willing to acknowledge how hard it is to kick a substance abuse problem. You know, how many times people have to go to rehab before it happens. But in the context of child welfare, people will say, oh, well, you know, they just need a 30 day program and then they can get their kids back and it'll all be fine. There's this amazing level of wishful thinking um, and, and just, again, naivete that accompanies our child welfare solutions. And I, it doesn't seem to be to be grounded in reality. Is this a part of a factor where it seems as if what ought to be our top priority, you know, the, the, how we treat children, has become an afterthought? Um, that it's no longer as important as other ideas and other ideo in our, in our ideology. Um, is, is this, you know, is this being accentuated uh, by, you know, by, as I said, the, this moral panic yeah. and talk about critical race? Um, are kids just being pushed to, side, to, to the side because of this? Children are just instrumental in this process, I think. I think of, of white people proving that they're not, you know, that they're not guilty or that they're too guilty. Um, I think the children are instrumental in the sense that we are not, you know, in the context of schools, we're, we're no longer going to provide them with a real education, one that will help serve them when they want to graduate, go to college or, you know, get a job. We're not going to teach them, you know, math or reading skills or anything like that. We're just going to teach them critical race theory. It's, it's our, it's performative. It's just let us show you like the ways in which we support social justice and whether or not your children come out the other end with an actual education is completely secondary. I think the priorities are totally screwed up when it comes to education. And what I see in child welfare is, is that to the nth degree, you know, plus the effects are much more harmful. Like, you know, a lot of kids at New York City prep schools are going to wind up just fine because their parents are going to teach them the things that they need to know, even if the school is just offering them critical race theory crap. But these kids, the most vulnerable kids, who are instrumental in child welfare workers and, and other activists showing their support for social justice, these kids are not going to be okay. And if you adopt policies that have been proven not to have their best interests at heart, you know, they're going to suffer. How has the pandemic impacted this? Um, you know, obviously it's impacted everything that's happened in our lives in the last year and a half. How has that particularly affected, you know, child welfare, but also children, you know, what are your thoughts about children in general? I mean, I, I have the feeling, I, I see the way, especially younger children, um, have sort of um, adopted this culture of fear. Um, not that there isn't something to be afraid about with a, with a deadly disease about, even though children are not as vulnerable to it as, as adults or certainly uh, elderly people. And I, I, get the, I get the impression, um, you know, that we have only scratched the surface on how this is going to impact their lives and their psyches. Um, you know, I think of my own parents who grew up in the Depression and who, under, you know, during the Depression, and who carried it with them the rest of their lives. You know, they, they went to their graves still impacted by what had happened to them when yeah. they were young. 
how, you know, how is this going to impact our kids now? Well, I mean, I'm not the first person to observe it, but I mean, we really threw kids under the bus this year. I mean, if school buses were operating, we would have thrown them under. I mean, it, it is, it's quite incredible. Um, you know, it's been well documented just how much of learning loss they experienced with schools being closed, what a disaster remote learning was, um, you know, how poorly they fared emotionally, um, especially adolescents, the, you know, high levels of suicidal ideation, you know, mental hospitals. I, I mean, I look at, uh, through the child welfare lens, I often look at what our capacity is for dealing with mental health problems for children. Now it's not, you know, foster kids who are necessarily over overwhelming these facilities, although they're having trouble finding beds for those kids, but they're just, you know, typical kids who can't, you know, deal with being locked in their house for a, more than a year. And, and it's perfectly understandable. So I think, you know, those are all the ways in which this has happened. In the specific child welfare context, um, you saw a, just a complete drop in the number of reports that were coming in of child abuse and neglect because kids were not in school, they were not being seen by other adults. Um, and, you know, many states reported that there was a, actually a higher level of serious incidents that resulted in emergency room visits uh, as a result of abuse that was really not detected early on. Um, and then you have, on the other end, a difficulty with uh, finding placements for these kids. You know, um, it was much more difficult for foster parents to be able to open their homes during the pandemic. You know, what if they had another child in their home? What if they, you know, they had somebody who was immunocompromised? Could they take in a stranger? How would visitation work if they were going back and forth with their biological family? So you definitely saw, you know, a real um, constriction of the system, and but in but in many ways a greater need for it to operate. Um, I, I just think the, the policymakers, um, it, it is it is you know miraculous in many ways that the child that um, the children were not affected by COVID in the same way they are affected by other serious diseases like the flu, and yet you have no acknowledgement from that on the part of policymakers. You know everything now is we're running around trying to figure out how to protect you know, children under the age of 12 who have not been vaccinated, and yet there's no evidence that these kids are getting seriously sick. So again, we're about to start another school year, you know, sacrificing their mental health, you know, their academic achievement, and, and their emotional health in, in order to, you know, what, make the adults feel more comfortable. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point because it is certainly kind of a cultural battle, um, just as masks sort of became the MAGA hat of sort of Team Blue in the last last year, which was kind of nuts, but it's true. Um, people, uh, you know, you see people putting their kids in masks while they're playing baseball outside, um, even though nothing I have read shows that that is any sort of, you know, that they're in any sort of danger while doing that with other kids. Um, and yet, you know, here we go. I mean, I get... Are we underestimating, you know, the, the threats to children here? I mean, from what's going on in our society? I mean, obviously children in certain in certain instances have been at risk. You, you talked about sort of the greatest threats to kids you know, living in single family homes with, uh, you know, a, a, an adult male who is not their father. Um, are we just ignoring all these threats to kids um, because of we're obsessed with other things? I think we've lost sight of kind of um, which threats are real and which threats are not. And I, I wrote a piece recently in National Affairs that tried to, to crystallize this a little bit because, um, you know, on the one hand, you have this kind of like free range parent movement and you have these people who are out there. And, and I agree with them largely that when it comes to kind of middle class America, we coddle our kids tremendously. We are, that's why we're masking them. We're like, you know, oh no, a germ might fall on Johnny, you know, or he might cross the street at the age of 10 by himself or something like, there, there are all of these, you know, risks that are in our heads or, or that are so tiny that we're not, you know, properly able to assess them. And, you know, our, our kids are just, you know, there is this kind of bubble wrap phenomenon when it comes to them. And, you know, that is certainly true in the sense of, you know, uh, of how we talk to them and, and how we educate them and, you know, trigger warnings and all this stuff. But then there's a whole other part of America um, where kids are really at actual risk. They're actually at risk for physical abuse. They're actually at risk for serious neglect because their parents 
are, you know, are high on drugs and they're and they're completely out to lunch. And, um, you know, they're they're actually at risk of, you know, being sexualized at a very early age because that's our culture and they're surrounded by it and they, they don't have parents who are protecting them from it. They're actually at risk for real violence because they're kids who live in the neighborhoods of Chicago where you would never walk, but, you know, who are getting shot on a regular basis. And so what's happened, unfortunately, is that we have the same kind of system that's supposed to handle both of those sets of children. And so sometimes, you know, people read these horror stories about how Child Protective Services, you know, came and, you know, arrested some mother because she let her, you know, eight-year-old walk around or, you know, walk to a park in a, you know, Maryland suburb a mile away by, by herself. And you and I would say, well, that's ridiculous. Of course, they're an independent kid. It's a safe place. Why shouldn't they be able to do it? But, but then you ask yourself, well, are there situations in which an eight-year-old probably shouldn't be walking a mile by themselves? And there are places in America where that's true. But unfortunately, I think we're, we're kind of getting confused in this conversation about which kids are actually at risk. And we're having trouble because everyone's trying to just extrapolate from their own experience without thinking about what other parts of this country and what other families and what other communities look like. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, let me broaden our discussion a little bit to, you know, one aspect of sort of what's been going on in this country in the last year and cancel culture. You have, a, you know, you have a, a particular story um, in that sort of before many people have heard of cancel culture as a term that sort of happened to you when you were sort of booted from the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, when you were blogging and, you, you know, you said something that you weren't, you know, that, um, people in the education establishment, or at least some people in the education establishment, didn't want you to say, um, and you wound up, you know, uh, you know, losing that position. But obviously, thank God you you you've, I've landed on my you've feet. Survived. Yeah. You, you've survived. You've gone. <laughs> yeah, right. You, you, you've done. You've done okay. Um, but that's an interesting story, and it's sort of to think that that was what nine years ago, yeah, or something yeah. like that. Um, where have we gone since then? It's now a very typical story, not an unusual one. Yeah, I, I mean, it is funny thinking back on this story. So I had been a blogger at the Chronicle and, um, you know, they just asked me to write, you know, something once or twice a week for their blog. I had written a book on higher education. They knew exactly what perspective I was coming from. I, you know, as a conservative, I'd written for a lot of conservative publications. I worked for the, I had worked for the Wall Street Journal editorial page. And um, so I wrote a piece about sort of some very silly uh, dissertations that the Chronicle had highlighted in a front page story um, in African American studies. And I said, you know, these are these are kind of silly and uh, and they they, um, you know, really just don't don't seem to pass muster. And I don't know why the Chronicle is is highlighting them. Um, they were very tiny and specific. And in addition, they were just purely um, writings of activism. They were not writings of scholarship. And um, so I you know, wrote kind of a, a somewhat brief critique of the, you know, of African American studies and how these were actually pretty good examples of the scholarship that's coming out of those departments. And um, so after I wrote that, I think some, something north of 6,000 academics signed a change.org, uh, whatever it was, change.org petition to get me fired. And I just, I remember just being completely shocked um, that because it, after, shortly after this, uh, this started happening, um, I remember I got a call from, uh, from Paul Jagot, who was my former boss at the Wall Street Journal, asking me, um, did I think I was going to get fired? And I said, of course not. That would be ridiculous. They hired me to be the conservative voice. Why, why in heaven's name would they fire me? And within 24 hours, they had fired me. And I just thought this, it struck me as so strange at the time. And now, of course, that's what people expect. Like, you know, nine years later, this is just your run of the mill, you know, firing story. And how could Naomi not have seen this coming miles away? And I sound so naive. Um, but it, it was interesting um, the way people talked in, in their petition, in their comments about how they felt like personally injured, you know, and unsafe by the things that I had said. And I was like, this is a blog in the Chronicle. Like, 
you don't have to read it, but you feel unsafe, really? Like, you've never met me. I've never threatened you. How could this possibly be? And so now, yeah, this this is just completely, you know, taken over so many workplaces. And I was fortunate that this was just a part-time gig. But if this had been my, you know, this had been my full-time job and my source of, you know, real employment. And, and by the way, I do recall that there was a, a guy at the Chronicle at the time who had previously, you know, worked at a newspaper, maybe like Long, Long Island Newsday or, you know, and I remember him being very surprised by this. I remember him thinking that he was working at like a real journalism publication and that they operated under the same rules as other, you know, as, as Newsday or the Wall Street Journal or something like that. And to be and how shocked he was when he found out that they did not. Now, I think, of course, you know, this has taken over journalism, too. You get you get fired from The New York Times or any place else for daring to say these things. So I yeah, I, I feel like I was one of the first uh, sacrifices. But but as you said, I, I I managed to land on my feet. I just it was such a, a shocking experience for me, I would say, in retrospect. Well, I guess, you know, in part because the book that you had written about academia, which had come out, I guess, a year or two before that. Um, the faculty lounge and, you know, other reasons why you won't get the college education you paid for. I had really addressed yes. this sort of thing, but um, clearly those six thousand no, people no, no. book, <laughs> or maybe they would have started a petition when they hired you yes. in the first yes, place. Yes, absolutely. Right? Um, that kind of leads me, you know, sort of in terms of, you know, critical race and how that's kind of taken over, you know, it's taken over our culture in some ways. Um, you know, anti-racism and the way it is being used in the schools and the way it's really promulgating, it's not just that they're adopting the 1619, you know, project from the New York Times, which is very, you know, problematic, fallacious history. It's sort of being integrated in a lot of things in the way kids are being taught. Um, and yet, by having kids focus on race, which is, you know, supposedly like the for the, you know, the advances from, you know, the 19th to the 20th to 21st century was that we understood that race was not a biological thing. It was, you know, something arbitrary that we sort of cooked up to, you know, create distinctions, which caused real damage and, and definite discrimination and, you know, horror, but that we are institutionalizing it again and making it even sort of more powerful in the lives and in the lives of children. Um, so are we training like little racists now? Because it is, you know, what is what is the impact of the way that's been promulgated in the schools? Yeah, I, I, I guess that's the goal is to train little racists um, because, you know, you're you're asking these kids at a very young age to start really thinking about racial differences in a very serious way. Like, you know, you stand over there, I'll stand over here. I'll have a different conversation with the teacher than you will. I should expect, you know, as a black person, I should expect to be treated differently. I should expect not to have, um, you know, any kind of autonomy over my life. I don't have any um, ability to control uh, my fate. I will be treated badly by the police, by the education system, by every adult who encounters me. Um, and, and that's sort of the expectation that's set. And for white children, the expectation that's set is that this is, I mean, it's funny because they, they talk about it, you know, this is the way that black people get treated and it's your fault. Um, you know, you maybe you didn't do anything, but it's still your fault, which is, of course, a, a moral message that we don't necessarily want to offer kids in any way that they don't have essentially saying, again, you don't have any control over this situation. You don't have any, even your actions, whatever your actions are, they're the wrong actions. You know, you could you could be nice to a black person and that would also be some form of white privilege. You could be mean to a black person. That would be a form of you could call them this name. You could you know, you could shake their hand the wrong way. You could do the wrong thing no matter what you try. And I think if you give kids that message, they'll be like, screw it. You know, I'll do whatever I want. I have no control over this situation. And I think that that lack of, um, you know, a, a sense that you have any control is, is, a, is a very poor message to be teaching, especially to, to young children of both, of any race. Um, and then you have a situation where we're living in this increasingly, you know, multi-ethnic, multi-racial society. 
everybody is multiple things. And so, you know, what are you supposed to have this internal division? Like the black part of me is, you know, this and the white part of me is that. And do I have to reject, you know, this parent or that parent or this relative or that relative in order to be in, on the moral high ground? Um, and, and you're right. Like, I think this whole insane discussion about what is and isn't critical race theory is silly because by the time it gets filtered down to like a third grade level, all it means is, I'm going to separate you out, I'm going to treat you differently, and I'm going to expect different things from you. And that is the message that gets through to an eight or nine year old. I don't know what you plan to be teaching, like doctoral level courses on critical race theory. That's not how elementary school works. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm reminded sort of like in the way that just as where we see on college campuses where there is now advocacy for separate housing for 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 black people or for black students, um, separating them out um, in a way that was you know it's the opposite of integration. It's the opposite of trying to create a more diverse environment for them. And yet, also you, you talked about like the way that so many Americans are multi, and yet by making the, in, in this way, it's sort of like we're we're going back. Actually, talking about you know things that are Jim Crow, our, our president likes to compare things that aren't Jim Crow to Jim Crow, with respect to voting laws. But the thing that reminds me of Jim Crow is that in in the you know in the South, even in the post Civil War South, there were miscegenation laws where anybody with a drop of of you know African American blood was considered a black person, and that therefore they were separated out. And yet, in the same way, we're treating, you know, people who are, you know, so many Americans are now, you know, multi-race or, or, and, and have different identities. We're doing the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, a friend just sent me um, a PowerPoint from her adoption training recently, and she's white, white and has adopted uh, three African-American kids. And she sent me the training. So not only did, was were um, uh, interracial families uh, had a separate seating area at the picnic, uh, to welcome adoptive families. Um, but in addition to that, I mean, the, the PowerPoint was just filled with ways you could not possibly parent the child who is coming into your home. You know, you just, you have to acknowledge your white privilege. You have to acknowledge that this child is being cut off, you know, from their real culture. You have to acknowledge that you can't really, you know, understand what this child is going through, um, that this child will always be separate from the rest of your family and your community. I mean, it is one, these documents, discourage people from ever wanting to adopt interracially because they just think this is not worth the trouble. And I'm a, I'm, I'm actually kind of a, a connoisseur. I, I write, I read a lot of advice columns. They sort of infuriate me, but I, but I can't help it. Um, and so in the last few years, you've seen actually this kind of really strange uptick in advice columns where people are writing about um, sometimes uh, interracial adoption. Sometimes they're even writing about like in vitro fertilization and, and there'll, there'll be a white partner and a black partner. And they'll say and the white partner will say, I think we should just have a, you know, use only white DNA because the black child in this country is, you know, has such difficulties and will face, you know, such levels of discrimination and abuse and they're going to get shot by police and I don't want to raise that child. I mean, the, the Klan could not have done a better job, frankly, at, at messaging at this point that, that white liberals across this country have bought into this crap is just infuriating to me on a level I cannot describe. Yeah, and, and unconsciously so. They, they, they think they are being anti-racist, yes. even as they are sort of codifying and, and you know, validating every racist stereotype from truly from from the darkest uh, period of American right. history. And I think, you know, it used to be more like this sort of harmless. I mean, I, I remember when our uh, when my son was at, um, you know, a, a, a Jewish day school and one of the other mothers we were out and she said to me they were maybe in second grade and she said to me that her son was so happy uh, that she was so happy that her son had become friends with my son because he's half black. And I was like looking at her. She's like, you know, I just, I think we need, you know, I, my son needs to experience diversity. 
I'm like, I, you know, I'm so glad you would, you would punch his I'm ticket so for it. I'm so glad I can serve that role for you. But I mean, you know, I think that sensibility has been building for a long time. This sort of like aesthetic need that you're, you have to feel like your child is not in a white bubble. And, you know, obviously this woman, you know, felt the need to say it out loud, but I'm sure it's a sentiment that other people felt too. But to get from that all the way to, I don't want any black DNA in my child because as a result, they'll get shot by police is just, it's, it's a leap. Like I, I really was not prepared for that level of quote unquote anti-racism. Yeah. Yeah. How do, you know, one of the anomalies of, you know, the, the, you know, the moral panic is uh, the way it has impacted the Jewish community. Um, in that, you know, now Jews have to account or, or, or being said that they're white um, in ways that, you know, are very perplexing since many Jews are not white. Um, you know, Israel is being treated as, you know, a, a collectively a possessor of white privilege, even though the majority of the Jewish population of, of Israel are technically people of color because they, you know, their origins are from the Middle East. Um, and sort of work, you know, Jews are kind of caught in between with, of course, the vast majority of Jews being, you know, very politically liberal and eager to glom on to anything that will, you know, sort of demonstrate their anti-racism at the same time. Um, where do you see this playing out? I mean, you speak oh, as a mother of, but, you know, of children who are half black and also Jewish. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to watch this. I mean, you know, I think... Um, during the, the, the protests last um, spring, you know, watching the, the PTO page of the Jewish day school fill up with parent after parent posing with their child and a Black Lives Matter sign, um, you know, and me just wanting to shake them saying like, do you realize who these people are? And do you realize just how deep the anti-Semitism goes in this movement? And, and they don't. And I think, um, and I, I'll, I'll tell you sort of a slightly uplifting story that came out of that because oh, I, I know, be nice. because sure. I got so mad and I just, <laughs> I, I wondered at the, I'm kind of marveled at what I thought was the ignorance of these people that they had, you know, felt the need to do this. I also don't like the posing with, you know, posing with your child with political activist signs. Like, you know, these are kids who are like seven years old. They have no idea what, anyway. So, um, uh, I was, you know, ranting about this. And of course, we're all, you know, stuck in the house. And, and my husband's like, don't get into a fight on Facebook with all the other parents at the school, please. Like, and I was like, okay, look, um, I'm going to, I'm going to try to think of some constructive way out of this. So, you know, I thought I'm going to give these these parents the benefit of the doubt. I know many of them and I like many of them. And I said, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and just say, they're trying to show support for something. And what, you know, what do they see? So I started composing paragraphs about um, organizations that I knew about that help underprivileged, frankly, mostly black kids. So I wrote a post about the Children's Scholarship Fund, which is an organization in, in New York City that sends kids, um, gives kids uh, scholarships to go to Catholic schools. Um, and, you know, these kids are typically in failing schools and they get to, you know, so I, so I wrote, I said, you know, there are racial disparities in this country. And if you're interested in helping black kids, you know, you should think about sending money to a group like the Children's Scholarship Fund and give these kids access to the kind of education that your kids have. And I wrote a few of them. I wrote one about a foster care organization. I wrote one about um, a program that reintegrates um, ex-prisoners um, into the workforce. Um, and I just, you know, and I said, you know, here's where to go if you want to donate money. So I don't, I don't know what happened with all of them, but I know the director of the Children's Scholarship Fund. And she told me, and I told her what I did, and she got donations of, you know, I think over $1,000 you know, that night just from, you know, people giving small gifts as a result of seeing my post. And it kind of made me think that I think a lot of people feel bad about the things that happen in this country, but they don't know how to direct their energies. 
And so I, I thought maybe if we have kind of a more constructive conversation, like not everything has to be about what is the source of the racial disparities. Like I'm happy to explain to you what I think is the source of them. But if you want to offer solutions that are specifically targeted toward particular communities, your picture of your Black Lives Matter sign does not do that. And here's what I would suggest instead. So that's my that's my one <laughs> uplifting story from the last year. Well, it's a good one um, and yeah. a rare one in that sense, uh, for sure, because one of the, you know, sort of the the um, impacts of, of this movement has been seen to be to give a permission slip to greater anti-Semitism. Yeah. Um, we've sort of... We sort of saw it in the streets um, after, you know, during the fighting between Israel and Hamas in May. Um, and we sort of see it in the way that public discourse has legitimized anti-Semitism in a way that, you know, through anti-Zionism, in, in a way that's, that's deeply troubling and in, and in some ways that, you know, we're... As a society, we're not addressing. Yeah. I'm, um, I'm much more worried do, about my this... kids experiencing anti-Semitism than racism, frankly. Like, I, I think if I had to think about what the dangers are to my kids on college campuses, it's anti-Semitism. Yeah. Um, well, because there is that's 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 OK. Yes. I mean, that's when we, we've said it's all right to think ill of Jews, to put them in a box as privileged and to you know, sort of consider parts of things that are integral to Jewish identity, one of which is Isra mm -hmm. Israel and, you know, and support for Israel as somehow inherently racist, you know, through intersectionalism, it's, it's the moral equivalent to, to being yeah. racist. Um, it doesn't, you know, that, that, that's, that's a, that's way, and that filters down to kids yeah, as well, doesn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, let me just switch for a moment to another one of your many interesting books. Um, several years ago, you wrote a book, Till Faith Do Us Part, about interfaith mm -hmm. marriage, um, touching on interfaith marriage across across the board. Um, obviously, to the Jewish community, that you know, it's sort of that that's an issue that has been sort of obsessively debated. Um, the debate on it has changed enormously in the last thirty years. Um, which to some extent reflects, you know, societal changes, because one of the more interesting statistics that I've come across recently is the way over the last 60 years, American attitudes towards interfaith marriage or even interracial marriage have changed tremendously in that at least what they're willing to say to posters, the majority of Americans say they're, you know, they're fine with it. The, the one form of intermarriage that they're against is their, their children marrying somebody from a diff different yeah, political exactly. party. Um, which is now opposed with the same numbers that used to be about interracial yeah. marriage, which I think is sort of says everything about yeah. American culture yeah. in a nutshell. Um, but certainly, you know, you, you understand it, you've experienced it. Um, and sort of the debate within the Jewish world has, for like the last 25 years, is sort of, you know, is this something to prevent or is it something to welcome? You know, do we make, you know, lemonade out of lemons? Is, is there no impact on our, you know, on the future of the Jewish community or none? Where do you see that debate having gone, you know, in the, in just in the last seven years, I guess, since you wrote that book? I mean, I guess I think most Jewish institutions have a kind of the horses left the barn attitude. Um, and I do think that there's a general acknowledgement that it does have a, an effect on Jewish continuity and, and the future of, of Judaism. I, I, I think it would be crazy if it, if people didn't see that. Um, I guess, um, you know, what I tried to do in my book is sort of offer a couple of ways to understand, um, you know, how interfaith marriage is affecting us. And I, and I liked, and I broadened it to groups outside of Jews because I thought these other groups might have something, uh, you know, offers, offer Jews something of a perspective too. Um, so one of the, one of the things that I thought was really interesting, um, is that interfaith marriage in general, um, uh, kids are about twice as likely to adopt the religion of their mother as the religion of their father. Um, you know, American religion is very much a women driven phenomenon. And you see this all the time. You, you know, people ask like, why are there no men in church? Um, and, and this is, you know, I think this is largely true in the Jewish community and you, and you see this now, you know, now that there are lots of female clergy, like you see 
women really, you know, driving the bus when it comes to um, to religion. And so, you know, thinking about that, um, you know, might might influence, you know, how you think certain, you know, certain kids are going to come out, depending on whether it's the mother or the father who is married out of the Jewish community. The other thing that I thought was interesting and, and offered some sense of perspective was the ways in which other communities approached um, intermarriage um, in the sense of how much they encourage the, the non-member spouse to actually join the community. Um, and this is something I think Jews have kind of fallen down on the job with, and many actually clergy and leaders sort of acknowledge this, which was that they're so, you know, Ju Judaism is such a non-proselytizing religion that it becomes almost like a fetish, like we'll never actually encourage someone to think about becoming a Jew. You could have a non-Jew who is literally coming to synagogue, you know, every week with the Jewish spouse and the kids, and no one will ever say to him, like, hey, you want to be a Jew? Like, it's almost like it's it's like a religious impulse to not say that. And actually, many non-Jews that I talked to, like, found that kind of off-putting. Like, what, you don't want me? Like, I'm doing all this. I'm happy to support the family in all these ways. But they're so used to being, you know, being an American in many parts of this country, you know, you get proselytized all the time. So you, you sort of people would take offense almost that the Jewish community didn't welcome them in. And that, that was sort of one thing that I started to think about more is like, you know, how welcoming we are to the non-members, not just as non-members, but would you like to join our community? Um, so I think that that was another thing that came up. I wanted to comment quickly about the, the political thing, because I saw that happening a while ago, how much more reluctant people were to marry across political lines than faith lines. Um, and it's funny, I think it, a lot of it has to do with how much we um, reveal about ourselves early on in a relationship. And so one thing that happens, I noticed this, you know, the, the older you are when you get married, the more likely you are to marry outside the faith, which is another problem for Jews who like to put off, you know, particular segments of the Jewish population who tend to put off marriage later and later. Um, but uh, one thing that, that that happens then is you tend to get married now at your least religious time in life. You're, you're sort of like you've graduated from college, you're moving around, you may not be part of a synagogue, you're not living with your parents. And so you kind of represent yourself as being a pretty secular person. And that's when you meet your spouse who may also be representing themselves as not, you know, purposefully trying to uh, mislead someone. Um, but religion is not the first conversation out of your mouth. And it may not be coming out of your mouth until when you're much closer to actually walking down the aisle. But politics is like on the tip of everyone's tongue now. You cannot wait to share your views on Fox News or MSNBC or Donald Trump or Joe Biden or abortion or guns or whatever. And so people find that out very early on about you. And unless they are some supremely tolerant person, they will literally say like, well, that's it. I, you know, that's where I draw the line. I can't, I have nothing in common with this person. And so I think like politics is sort of now front and center so much in our conversations that we're not willing to bridge that divide, but religion has taken this back burner and we don't realize until much later that there might be religious conflicts. Do you think that politics has actually taken on the role that religion used to play in the lives of most for, for many Americans, that's no doubt true. They probably feel more strongly about politics than they do about religion in some cases. Although I do make the case that I think at those moments in life that are you know most important to you at marriage, at the birth of a child, at the death of a parent, all of these things, you know, those religious experiences and feelings that you grew up with do take on this importance. And that's when people find themselves in a difficult situation in an interfaith relationship because they suddenly realize, oh, wait, that is important to me after all. And I have made it seem like that's not important at all. Yeah. Um, another really interesting book that you wrote, uh, Got Religion, you discussed the way that, uh, well, you know, I've been reading That's your books for a nice while. That's very nice of you, Jonathan. So I'm, I'm I appreciate it. This, this, <laughs> this, is my, this is my chance to at least, you know, get in a question about each of them. But you, um, but you know, your, your book, Got Religion, you talked about the way young people were dropping out of, um, of faith and of churches, mosques, synagogues. That is certainly considered to be, you know, a, a huge problem, certainly for non-Orthodox Jewry in this country. Um, and you talked in that book about what some institutions were, were doing to combat the trend. Um, it's a bigger problem from Jews, I think. I, I don't think, you know, 
So the Jews are probably the least, the surveys show that we're sort of the least religious, uh, at least as far as the non-Orthodox are concerned of, of pretty much any American mm -hmm. demographic group. Um, and that's shown by, you know, every demographic survey of American Jews talks about that the largest growing group or demographic slice are people that the demographers are calling Jews of no religion. Um, you know, and to a certain extent, uh, people within the Jewish community or Jewish organizations are almost embracing this as saying, well, that's okay. We're just evolving into something else, even though that seems like, you know, a, a half a passage out of any sense yeah. of Jewish peoplehood, let alone connection to faith. You know, where do you see this going now? I mean, um, I don't see much progress being made in the Jewish community um, towards towards retaining younger people um, outside of outside of faith. Yeah, I I have no idea what you know Judaism. Uh, what what Jews of no religion have in the long run? Like you could, I think it's you know you could be a, a, a cultural Jew, um, but the likelihood that you're going to pass that down to your children is pretty low. I mean, I think you know you may like you know some gefilte fish and you may speak a few Yiddish words here or there, but that's not something that I think kids really internalize very much. I mean, and, and I think you know it, it would just be like you know, being Irish or Italian. I mean, I, you know, which is not to say that there's no Irish or Italian culture. I mean, you go to parades and, you know, eat some, uh, you know, Italian or Irish food, some corned beef or whatever. Um, but I don't think those people are thinking about those, you know, being Irish or Italian as values that you're passing on to your children or as anything, mm -hmm. um, more intangible than that. So no, I don't think that there's been a lot of progress. I do think, um, you know, it, it's Jews, do, you know, the, the, I, I just can't get away from the age of marriage as being the most important factor that I found in my survey as influencing the likelihood that Jews will marry out. And, and frankly, you know, marriage is also what brings people back to institutions. So the longer you're away from you know, the longer you wait to get married, the longer you're away from institutions, the less likely you will be to have that kind of sense of Jewish continuity. Um, and I think that it's it becomes really hard for people to kind of, the longer they're away, to, to drag themselves back to it. Um, I think a lot of institutions have really tried very hard reaching out to younger people. Um, you know, we have a kind of interesting situation in Westchester, where I live, where you know, the the largest conservative synagogue, you know, has this critical mass of young adults who go um, and, you know, young parents, too, who go. And what's happened is all of the other conservative synagogues, I think, have started to empty out into that conservative synagogue. So then you have this, like, consolidation, but all these other institutions are sort of withering as a result of not having that younger population. Um, it's it's just a really hard nut to crack. I mean, I looked again in that book at other religious institutions and other ways that religious groups were trying to reach out to this younger audience. Um, one thing that came up a lot, which of course has a you know sort of is similar to Orthodox Judaism, is the number of churches that have um, readopted a kind of neighborhood model. Like they really want to draw from people who are right there, people who they'll encounter regularly in the, their daily life, not just on Sundays at church. Um, ways that the neighbor, people in the neighborhood can support each other and see each other and go visit each other and, and volunteer. Um, and, and so, you know, whereas the, you know, for instance, like the evangelical world had moved away from that in large part, like there were these mega churches, people would drive 45 minutes to hear this great pastor and go to this coffee shop and have this child care. A lot of younger people felt very disconnected from that, and they moved back to a neighborhood model, which I thought was interesting and probably, you know, a sign that that that's one of the things that Orthodox Judaism has as a strength, that it is so, you know, small community neighborhood based because you have to be able to walk to synagogue. Um, but I don't necessarily right. know that other Jewish communities are going to have be have any ability to adopt that kind of a model. Um, you know, there were other things, too, that I tried to emphasize in the book. 
Um, I, I didn't think that social media and technology were frankly very big factors in influencing young people coming back. They really longed for, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of the authentic connection. And frankly, they could get social media and technology every other day of the week. They didn't need to get it on Saturday too, or on Sunday. And the, the question is like, what religious institutions are bold enough to say like, we're we're offering something different in your life. We're not just like the rest of your life. And I think those are the institutions that are going to be able to survive and thrive. Yeah, that's an important insight. Well, Naomi, thank you so much. Um, this uh, time has kind of flown by. Um, you gave us a lot to think <laughs> about and to chew over. Um, it was a pleasure having you on. Thank you to our audience for tuning in. Please like, follow, give us good reviews on Spotify, Amazon, Apple, Google, wherever you're listening to pod iHeartRadio, wherever you're listening to podcasts, or on YouTube where you can watch the video, the JNS YouTube channel. Thanks again, and see you next week. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.